Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames are back from the All-Star break and went 1-1-1 one, one, and one this week, but still on the outside looking in. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, good to have you back. Yeah, um, like Anderson uh, had some difficulty with a car accident, so that's why I missed last episode. But you were I'm not fine. on a scooter. No. I thought it's interesting that the Flames press release specifically mentioned he was on a scooter. Like, I didn't know if they were trying to say that he was reckless on it or just he was going faster than... Um, he should have been. I didn't know why Scooter was in there because those things were always very specifically crafted. Yeah, well, um, it, it's one of those where I think because of the nature of it, uh, it, them being on the road, that it would be a little weird for him to get into a car accident where like he was driving. So uh, that's why I think they had to clarify just because that would be a little bizarre. Like, why are you renting a car type of thing like you know what i mean like it's just a little would be a little odd and in the end raz is okay you're okay so now we get to talk flames hockey again yep and thanks as always to our friend kevin olenick uh, from shifts and pucks who managed to clear waivers so he could come chat with us and fill in for you yep you thanks get, kevin you guys are gonna put me over the salary cap if we keep doing this well you know it's only money it's <laughs> says, says the guy not cutting the checks. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's jump in and talk about this past week. The Flames came back from their uh, all-star break, bye week, whatever you want to call it, on the 6th. And they had a road trip there, three, three games into the four-game road trip. And they played their first game back on the 6th in uh, Manhattan. The Calgary Flames took on the New York Rangers. And it was a 5-4 Rangers win in this one. Matt, this is not what I expected from the Calgary Flames and the New York Rangers. Like This felt like an 80s Battle of Alberta grudge match. Yeah, I know. The feistiness. Uh, yeah, it, it's one of those games where um, it's showing that like Calgary still has a long way to go in terms of uh, mental discipline if they want to consider themselves a playoff caliber team because... Like, you're going to get hit. And, like, we saw that in the playoffs last year and in years previous where, like, John Klingberg for Dallas would run one of our guys and, like, it would throw a certain player who's now in Florida off his game entirely for, you know, the rest of the series. And, (laughs) you know, it's one of those things that, like, yeah, Truba did kind of headhunt Dubé and kind of did headhunt Kadri a bit. Not that he made contact with either of them in the head, but, you know, it. he definitely, like, if the guys were hunched over at all, he would have hit them head first. And, you know, like, it, Calgary responded by giving up two power plays on that those two hits, and one of them ended up being a goal that ended up deciding the game ultimately. Of a 60-minute game, the Flames were penalized for 41 minutes. That means for two whole periods we had at least one guy in the penalty box yep flames hockey (laughs) i mean yeah it's it's not what i expected but you know as much as i i mean i wasn't excited about this game it's the new york rangers you know it's not a division or or even conference opponent but it makes me wonder what's going to happen when we see them again on the 18th in calgary like i think there's going to be a lot of bad blood there still well, thankfully, one of the guys, uh, Blaze, got uh, traded to the Rangers, so we don't have to worry about that guy hitting Lucic again. He got traded but, from uh, the Rangers. Yeah, uh, he's now with the St. Louis Blues, and we don't play them again, so problem solved. We just have to worry uh, about Tarasenko. Yeah. Woo, exciting. Uh, <laughs> but, um, no, the the team played uh, reasonably well. Well, I'm going to clarify Jacob Markstrom played really well in this game. He gave up five goals, and I can't really fault him for any of them. And I I feel that uh, the Flames' defense kind of was the goat on this one. Um, and the overreacting to everything that the Rangers did physically. Yeah, I can, I can agree with that. I don't think that those goals were... Markstrom's fault by any means. I think it was. Uh, I, I think saying it's the defense. Yeah, I think that's probably probably makes sense. Well, especially a team like the New York Rangers, who have so many offensive weapons, you can't just let them walk down Broadway and 
you know, it, like especially the overtime goal, which was just all sorts of stupidity from the all three guys on the ice. Like if any of them had done the correct play at any point, that goal doesn't go in. But you know, like there's literally only so there was a lot of mental misses by the defense. Yeah, like it was just you know, like this is one of those where you take the tape and you know you say, okay, all of this. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> yeah, because it, it was just one of those. You know, and to be fair, like the offense got going, they scored four goals. That normally is enough, and you know, it, and normally if we're talking, oh, Markstrom's a net, it's usually a bad thing. But um, over the last couple of weeks, I have to give him a lot of credit in his starts. He's actually performed adequately and. You know, more like the Markstrom that we're used to. His time not... at Ranchman's over the break seems to have rejuvenated him. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it, he got his reviews on his singing abilities, and now he's, you know, rededicating to the You just got to and... sing it out when you're having problems. We'll have to have Sal Dome karaoke. Just give the man a microphone, and everyone else can go for lunch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, my ears, my ears. <laughs> that's why no one else has to be on the ice. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Maybe we can even get him to do the Cadillac Ranch dance or something in his goalie pads. Yep. <laughs> um, I don't know why I was surprised, but Yaroslav Halak was in net for the Rangers. I didn't think that guy was still around the league. Oh, he's always been a really good goaltender at, at times. And, like, when he's on his game, he's as good as any goalie in the NHL. It's just so inconsistent just with like him. The Adam Rajishka of goaltenders. Yeah. When he's on, he's really good. When he's not, it's like... Wow, um, you're being paid by an NHL team, are you? Uh, <laughs> and to his credit, he's been on a very hot streak lately, and he kind of stole the starters net from Shesterkin, which kind of goes to show you how good he's been playing, that he's actually beating out Shesterkin for starts. Uh, but, you know, again, to the Flames' credit, we actually did manage to get four goals on him, and it could if Halak wasn't on his game, it could have been seven or eight. It's just... In one of those games where everybody just kept trading chances and ultimately the Flames ended up on the short end of the stick. Well, the, they were also on the short end of the stick for uh, the game against the Detroit Red Wings, one that we didn't probably think they'd be on the short end of the stick for two days later. This is the game uh, we were talking about earlier, but for those that don't know, before this game, um, Rasmus Anderson was going to dinner, was on a scooter, got hit by a car it sounds like he's doing okay but he was uh, in hospital for part of this game so was not in the flames lineup and the flames ended up dropping uh two to one loss to the red wings here this i think when we look at it this is a game you had to win oh for sure and like anytime you're playing a team that's currently out of the playoff spot because like all the teams that are currently out out are like well out of a playoff spot and um, like Detroit's like seven, eight points out of the second wild card. Like they're not going to get there. And, you know, like this is very much a rebuilding, retooling year for them. And they're just counting days to the deadline before they can ship Bertuzzi out and, you know, whatever else isn't stapled down. And like the Flames, to their credit, uh, held them to very few shots through the first 45, 50 minutes. Um, didn't really allow a lot of chances, but, you know, um, you actually need to be able to string some shots and passes together and, and generate some scoring chances, and the Flames just kind of... Flames uh, got 36 shots on net, but I would not say probably more than... I'd have to look at the stats, but just off the top of my head, I would say not more than probably a dozen quality shots. Yeah, if that. Uh, and, it, it, you know... You can make goalies look really good on the stat sheet, and this is one of those where, like, the, the goalie for Detroit did not have a difficult time, Billy Huso. Like, he just, it, it was a, as easy of a 36, 35 save uh, performances that you can have. And, yeah, it, it's frustrating because, like, the Flames need the points, and, like, they're currently, like, five points out of the space ahead of them, and you know, seven from the division, and it's, you know, you 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 don't really have any margin for error now, guys, and, you know, you have to actually put bad teams away, and, you know, you can't, even though they're an Eastern team, like, you need to beat them, and 
you know, it doesn't directly impact you, but, um, you know, the time's running short, and if you want to actually, you know, make the playoffs this year, um, the, the clock's ticking. Well, they got that message that you got to beat the bad teams, and on Saturday, in what has to be, I think, the earliest start I can ever remember for a Flames game, a 10.30 Mountain Time start, uh, the Calgary Flames went out. I was a little bit worried in this one. In the first three shots, the Buffalo Sabres had two goals, and I thought, oh, crap, Markstrom's falling back to his usual pattern this year of letting goals in early, but the Flames found a way and uh, ended up winning 7-2 to two with a whole bunch of milestones here. Ten Flames had at least one point. Six Flames had more than one point. We had Peltier's first goal, Gilbert's first goal as a Flame, and Gilbert's first game-winning goal. Dubé's four point, or his first four-point game. I think this might be the first time the goalies had an assist this year. Um, a whole bunch of firsts and a whole bunch of great milestones. Yeah, and Gilbert even got an assist on one of the goals too. So, two-point um, game for Gilbert. Yeah, which in front of the family and friends, that's the way to go about it. And uh, I thought the Flames uh, played very well in the first period. And like, if the score was two nothing, but the other way around, that would have made entire sense. Um, it just like that shot by Tag Thompson. No goalie is going to stop that. It, you know, it, I don't fault Marks from on that one. Um, the lack of composure on the second goal where he was about eight inches over to the left of where he needed to be, uh, that, you know, he needs to stick on his positioning a little better. Um, and, like, that's been a consistent problem this year is he just tends to drift a little too far one way or the other. And, you know, that opens a whole lane uh, for players to shoot at. And, like, what should have been a very very basic and routine save ended up in the back of the net and you know like that could have been curtains for this team if they didn't blow the doors off in the second period yeah i i I agree and i think if you had two like after that first period and i agree the flames didn't play bad but i was thinking after that first period crap if we lose to detroit and then we lose to buffalo this is not gonna be what we want you know going coming out of the all-star break no, like, realistically, like, you know, I, I was doing a little bit of show prep uh, during that intermission, uh, just putting my own thoughts on the week together, and was like, um, maybe this team needs to either look at selling players or firing the coach immediately, because something... They could know, do like a, a Gerard Glenn, just leave Daryl in New York. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those where it's like, uh, you know, like something's got to give here. Get like, Daryl a horse to ride back to Calgary, on, not on the bus. Yeah, like it, it you know, and it, it's one of those like, it, you know, because like this team has drastically underperformed, in my opinion, throughout most of the season, and the advanced statistics show that they've been pretty much perpetually underperforming, and a lot of that's due to poor goaltending performances but you know so eventually you guys need to like step up and actually start hitting the mark and thankfully in the game they were able to turn it around it's just like as much as it you know the rangers game was not markstrom's fault like if the this game had gone off the rails and they lost like the the goat horns would have been on markstrom in this one and it's like, you know, the conversation would have to shift of do you conveniently find an injury on Markstrom to set him aside so that way you can call Dustin Wolf up, you know, and see what you've got because, like, literally, you know, anything's better than one of the worst goalies in the NHL. Um, you know, it, it, well, I think there would have been a lot of questions up and down the lineup at that point. Yeah, and, like, is this an actual playoff team? You know, like, are any of the players actually serious about, you know, making the playoffs, et cetera, et cetera? And it, it, you know, thankfully, like, they were able to turn around. It's just they can't keep shooting themselves in the foot with games like this where, like, you know, coming down from 2 nothing is a hard thing to do in the NHL. And, yes, it's easier now than it previously has been, but it's still a tall tale to actually force your way back. And, you know, you can't use that as a reliable uh, method to actually winning games. And 
you know, thankfully Buffalo is very bad defensively. Like, that's literally the only reason why, like, if they were playing an actual decent team, the Flames lose that game. And, well, we know, had, it's just frustrating. We talked previously about Jacob Peltier, and we've seen him really consistently in the lineup since before the All-Star break. He finally got moved to, I think, where you and I both expected he would be in the top six, playing with Kadri and Huberto in that game. And uh, Peltier got on the board finally. His first NHL goal, it was the... Uh, really the first Flames goal of the game at 2.17 in the second period. Jacob Pelty assisted by Kadri and Huberto. And I don't know who was more excited, him or the bench. Like, you could just see some excitement from all the guys when he scored that goal. Yeah, well, you could see uh, in, like, every game he's played, he's pretty much generated at least one or two good scoring chances every game. And it's like, eventually one of them's got to go in for you, kid. Like, you know, and thankfully in this one that was a really nifty move to psych out the goalie just enough so that way he could lift it over his blocker and just a perfectly play shot and he looked like a 10-year vet on that play and well it's uh, hard know, not to when you're playing with those guys yeah and you know he's fit right in with Kadri and Huberdo and I, I think you're starting to see a lot of chemistry developing between them and especially because Peltier is more of a drive the net type guy uh, which his line mate Huberdo's line mates in Florida were Bennett and uh, Anthony Duclair, who were both crash the net type guys. You know, stylistically, it fits very much the way that Huberdo uh, likes to play the game. So there might be a good fit moving forward with those three, and hopefully, this is just you know the start of positive things to come and I think you know when you and I have talked about Jacob Peltier this year and either before he came up and looking at where he'd slot in or when he did come up looking at where he'd slot in I think we both agree this is probably the right slot for him and the right line mates on this team putting him on that fourth line wasn't the right spot for him I understand why Daryl did it to get him probably protected minutes but I think when we look at the makeup of this forward group that's where Peltier should be right now yeah for sure and um just stylistically he complements the other two and he's got enough uh jam in his game that his game complements Kadri's in a lot of ways as well so it, you know it really is a very good fit between those three and it's one of those things where this team like if the Mudjapane Backlund Coleman line has been consistently the best line in the NHL since they've been put together according to like all the advanced statistics um fewest goals against, highest goals for, uh, percentages and all of that. Who was it a few years ago? We had, uh, we had Backlund, Froelich, and somebody that was a really good line for us as well. Kachuk. Kachuk. Right. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, you know, like if, like Lindholm, Dubé, and Toffoli have been very consistently decent as a first line, um, not great, but you know, for a first line, they're producing like first line players. Um, if the second line with Huberdo, Kadri, and Peltier can get going, where they're reliably uh, generating offense, now you all of a sudden have three lines that are all being very effective in what they're doing, and now you've got a very balanced attack throughout the lineup. And you know, now it's just a matter of sorting out the fourth line to make sure that like the right guys are playing in those roles because uh, in the, the game against Buffalo the fourth line was noticeably like the worst line by quite a fair margin um, but you know like uh, it's one of those where this is why it was necessary to have Peltier up and Phillips up at various points of the season was to see if you could because uh, the, they needed a second line winger on this team and better to know if one of the guys can fit from within instead of having to go trade for insert name here. Well, and the thing I like about this too is right now it really feels like each line also has an identity and a purpose. Where before it just looked like we were taking sort of our best forwards and, you know, putting them onto lines, which I guess there's nothing wrong with that in some sense, but it feels like now every line has an identity. That backland line, like you said, is I would say a great two way line. They can both move the, you know, the puck towards the net they're great at, at defending they're a great two-way line which every team needs and that's what you know Backlund does so well um I, we've got some firepower there I feel like our first line definitely has its 
you know, first line feel to it. And, and it's a very scoring dynamo line with Lindholm to Foley, but still has a little more defensive responsibility in that second line. Like you said, I feel is almost a power forward line in a way. Like we've got Huberto, Peltier and Kadri. You've got some grit. You've got the ability to, you know, dig in the corners there and you've got the scoring finesse too. Yeah. And it's one of those where like now this team, like if they can start getting some consistency in the effort uh, from game to game, where they're driving the net more, and like we've seen, like when they've had games where they've scored five of six, seven goals, where like consistently they're getting into the high danger scoring areas and driving that area and putting pucks in, and in games where they struggle, like the Detroit game, they're too passive. Uh, shooting from a distance, not allowing plays to just develop organically, and kind of like forcing plays instead of just going with the flow. And um, it, it's just interesting to see like when you, the, the team is in those two different uh, disparate conditions, just how different their offensive game is. And you know, like if they consistently start getting their bodies into the, those higher danger areas then this team, you know, because on paper, like, it, talent-wise, like, this team is not very much different from what we saw last season from this team. And, you know, like if your offensive system is very much in the same manner that the team was last year, where you're getting guys in front of the net and into the high-danger areas, you know, like, there was a reason why the Flames were one of the top-scoring teams last year. And, you know, if you're able to get that consistency, then, like, this team could finish strong and in, into the playoffs. But it, it's this up and downness that we've seen where, like, they're just awful against Detroit, and then they're just amazing in the second and third period against Buffalo. And it's, like, you can't have, like, a 3 out of 10 game and then a 9 out of 10 game. You know, you have to be, a, like, a solid 7 minimum each game and we're just not seeing that yet well that inconsistency is what has the flames currently sitting outside of a playoff spot they are number three in the wild card race calgary's now played 53 games uh they have 25 wins 18 losses and 10 overtime losses for a total of 60 points which ties them with minnesota who's in the second wild card spot one game in hand that means the flames are five points down from la and if we look at the three teams that hold one, two, and three in the Pacific, they're five points down from Edmonton, who has 65, Seattle also 65, and Vegas 68. So, you know, as, I mean, as much as we, and maybe this is, you know, too big a thinking, but as, as much as we say, you know what, the Flames are not doing well and not consistent, they're, what, four, I mean, eight points. So let's call it four wins away from tying Vegas. Yeah, and they they also have a game in hand on Vegas as That's well. That's true. So. And you look at all of the teams in the Flames division, and, like, none of them are particularly strong. Like, I would not expect any of the four teams ahead of the Flames to come out of the West and represent the West in the finals. Um, you know, like, uh, outside of Calgary, like, uh, Dallas and Colorado, in my mind, are the two strongest teams throughout, and it will probably be the Dallas Stars, uh coming out of the west this year and it's one of those where like calgary frankly like their ideal target is to be second or third in the pacific where they're facing you know insert miscellaneous other team here and or one of the wild card teams because um you know like if you look at like when uh daryl was successful um with uh, the LA Kings, like the fl the Kings were very much the underdog, and yet that like they were a very stacked team, and they didn't have any expectations heading into the postseason because uh, like they were the bad team, and they were supposed to lose, and they were able to um, upset teams all the way to the cup, and. Calgary very much is similarly built in terms of where they have talent throughout the lineup. It's just, you know, getting the engine turned over um, to, you know, uh, start translating those performances into consistent wins, which, you know, like they're 5 4 and 1 in their last 10, which is pretty much as down the middle as you can get. 
Well, we're less than three weeks away from the NHL trade deadline, which is March 2nd this year. So being mid-February, it's that time of year to start looking ahead to trade deadline. And um, more and more talk coming out about trade deadline, philosophies, that sort of thing. As we know, our general manager here, Brad Living, has said in the past, his team will dictate what he does at trade deadline. And he's said so far in a few interviews, um, right now his team hasn't told him what he needs to do. So they, you know, last year they were a great team, and they and that was his signal that it's not like somebody walks into his, into his room and tells him what to do, but their play has not given him that indication. So he can't go. He feels make those big deals like he did last year. Not quite sure of me, maybe as a buyer or a seller, what he should do. Um, but some interesting notes coming out from the fourth period today, and David Pegnata over there, he had said that the Flames are poking or were poking around on Arizona's Jacob Chikrin. As of as of the time that that was reported, Nick Kiprios also said that sounded like Chicken would be heading to L.A. Uh, Brad Treliving's checking in on everybody and isn't happy where the team sits in the in the standings right now. And as you and I know, that's one thing that Tree Living's known for is checking in on everything, kicking every tire. And um, if there's a move two or three out there that he feels will improve the club's chance of making the playoffs, he's interested in exploring it. Pegnata said. So, what are your thoughts on the on that report? Well, and that's very much the pragmatic, realistic way of looking at it. And, like, this team hasn't gotten their stuff together, and a lot of that is on the goaltending um, and, frankly, the overall team defense. And, it, you know, it, it makes sense. Like, this team's been in an adjustment period uh, for most of the season um, up until more recently. It's just like, okay, cool, you've had your adjustment period now it's time to actually start getting going and like we're seeing markstrom still you know better than he was but not good and like he was on pace to having like one of the worst seasons in the goalie in 25 last 25 years in the nhl so you know like the fact that he's pulling up from that is a good thing it's just he's got a long way to go um, We've got eight and, games until the trade deadline. Like as much as I agree with you that he's got a ways to go, when do you, when do you decide that he's not going to do it? Well, and that that's where like if the these struggles continue to the trade deadline, I think that's where it, you give him up until that point, and then you call up Dustin Wolf. Like if he's not playing well, uh, call Wolf up because Wolf's tearing up the AHL he did Either last Wolf year. or give Ladar more starts and develop him into a starter. Yeah. Well, it, it, I would be making it the dreaded three-headed monster and giving Wolf like three or four starts uh, down the, the stretch to see, um, you know, it, because like if the Flames are able to make the playoffs... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to keep Wolf here because I think his value to the to the Wranglers, who are number one in the AHL, is valuable, especially right now with Oscar Danskout. But I could see maybe calling him up for the couple back to backs in March and making it a Vladar Wolf pair. But otherwise, I think I would go with Vladar as the starter and maybe Markstrom as the backup. Yeah, and it's one of those where, like, you know, if Markstrom's continually bad, this is like only if Markstrom's bad. Uh, would you even entertain the idea of bringing Wolf up? Because, you know, like, as much as, like, the AHL's important, the NHL team's more important. And, it, you know, it, it's one of those where, like, that's your trade deadline acquisition to shore up the goaltending is to bring Wolf up. I think if you make that decision, though, to bring Wolf up, at that point you're kind of saying, we don't think we're in this. Well, it, it's more of, uh, you know, like, if we're going to make the playoffs, we're going to have to have a different horse taking us there uh, because the two aren't doing it. And, you know, as good as Vladar has been, like, he's not, like, even looking at his stats, like, he's a very below average goaltender uh, in terms of the NHL. And, you know, he's an excellent backup, but he's not performing at a starter's level uh, stat-wise. But also remember, this is a guy who's played 48 National Hockey League games. I'm not arguing that. Uh, And that's why I think if you're going to do it, and I know what you're saying too, but I think if you want to make that change, run Vladar. I think there's something there, but it has to be developed. Oh, I agree. And like, 
say like over the next five games, Markstrom's likely going to start three or four of them. Like, say he's bad. I think that's when you start, to, uh, just start Vladar running forward. And then, you know, like after the trade deadline, that's when you bring basically Wolf up to replace Markstrom as the backup. And, and yeah, I, I could I could see that. I still think there's more value than a lot of people give credit for to a uh, AHL team going on a Calder Cup run and learning how to win in the playoffs. I think, you know, yes, the NHL is important, but I think at that point, if your goaltending is Vladar and Wolf, you're kind of saying, you know what, we're not expecting to go deep here. Yeah. So well, I think, and I think at that point, when I look at March, I would play. Wolf in either Dallas or Minnesota, which is a back-to-back. We have Arizona the next week. Then we have a L.A. Arizona back-to-back. Like I think you could, even if you were to bring Wolf up kind of once a week to play, I think you could still get him some NHL starts. Yeah, and that's about like what I was thinking of um, as well, uh, and ter- like exactly what you said there uh, in terms of like, or give him the Anaheim him game on the tenth in front of his hometown crowd. Yeah. Any of those uh, Yeah, I just I, I guess I'm just saying I don't know if I would keep him up here as a three-headed monster, just sort of do, you know, oh, no. bring, it, bring it him up, be, send him back down. Yeah, it would be a tactical up and down kind of thing. I, I wouldn't keep them him up here the whole time. Goalie it hokey be, pokey. Yeah, exactly. And shift them all about and see what, how it goes. That's right. and, you know, and you also have to remember, like, the AHL basically plays on the weekends only, so it's also more feasible to bring him up during, like, the actual week to play a game as yep. well. Well, so. that's it. I mean, he could play, let's say, the 7th, which is a Tuesday, and then be back with the Wranglers by Friday. Yeah, which would be ideal. And and, and I this, think is only, thing... this only scenario is going to happen yeah. in my head is if, like, Markstrom continues to be absolutely dreadful and, like, Vladar's, you know, and, like, the Flames go on, a, like, a little bit of a losing streak-ish where, like, they're more or less 500 or below over, like, now to the All-Star, or er, to the trade deadline. And Because there's like, so much uncertainty, I think that you're not going to see Tree pull off the big early deal. Like, it was about this time last year they brought Toffoli in. Yeah, the only time, the only way that I could realistically see the Flames making a bigger deal uh, would be, like, kind of like the Chikrin deal. Um, Like, if you have a guy that you're going to have on your team for a number of years uh, who's, like, the right age and, like, a good defensive defenseman, you know, like, that makes sense regardless of what time of year you're getting that guy. And if it just so happens it's at the trade deadline and the cost makes sense... Sure, you pull that deal, and then, like it wouldn't matter if you're pulling that deal in uh, June before the draft in free agency or. Yeah, at the I, just, trade I just don't know that the Flames have the assets they would need to make a hockey deal right now. And that's where it'll be interesting to see. And like you know, I like I could see, um, say like the Flames including like a first round draft pick and like Matthew Coronado as much as we'd like to not shed prospects. You know, like, that could be a feasibility uh, to address um, that. Uh, it, it's, would I expect that kind of a thing to happen? Realistically, I, I think it's about a 5 to 10% chance, and it would literally only be if the cost made sense. Uh, but, yeah, like, realistically, I think uh, the, the Flames... If they're going to buy, because of the play of uh, Jacob Peltier, like, I, I think that uh, they might be both kind of in the buyer and seller mode where, like, they might ship off a depth forward or two. Um, and uh, Well, let's, let's they... break this down a little bit more. Let's look at three possible scenarios here, and we won't talk about what we personally think. We'll do that at the end. But to me, there's three scenarios you see for the Flames. They're either buyers, they're either sellers, or we'll call them marginal additions. Like, we've seen Tree in the past go out and get the, you know, the depth defenseman or Curtis Lazar or things like that. And I think you could still see those trades being made in, let's call it a stand pat mode. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, and that that's kind of like what I would mean. Like, say, like, if a team really wanted Milan Lucic, say, for... You know, physical. It's only going to happen if thing. Tree's got nude pictures of somebody or something. He needs to. 
Well, no, some on. some teams like having that physical edge in the playoffs, and I just know, don't like think the, anyone wants to pay what it would cost, though. Well, that's where like a team like Boston, say, where, who has that familiarity, and like if the Flames ate half, which wouldn't be out of line, it would be entirely doable. And you know, like I could see that kind of a trade, like shedding that kind of a player depth forward out, uh, just to you know create space for somebody else but um it, and just similar the other way of getting like a f- five six defenseman like a luke shen or that in general type of yeah. just de- you know the Derek forborts of yesteryear like you know the what? insert defensive defenseman but like th- those kind of deals are like your kind of standard stat pat stand pat kind of deals and not anything exciting really well let's look at each of these scenarios so if the flames are buyers if Sutter thinks he can buy his way out of the team's inconsistency we don't necessarily have to get into individual players I know you've talked about uh, a couple guys at Chicago in the past and things like that what do you think the flames be looking for in a buy scenario and what assets do they have to give up well realistically um, draft picks would pretty much be the main currency if they're buying and I think that, like, in the past, uh, like, say, mentioning Patrick Kane, that was under the assumption that the Flames were going to be more where Vegas is yeah. in the standings, not where they currently are. Um, so, like, if they're going to go and get that buying-type uh, situation, uh, you're going to be wanting to get somebody that's the right age instead of... Um, that you know necessarily the name for the rental um you know so like say like going and getting like a travis connectney type guy who might be wearing his welcome or a tyler bertuzzi under the assuming assumption that you're going to be able to keep him that kind of guy uh where you can slot him in for like the next handful of years um and like have the guy for like five or six years so he's a part of your team like the Kadri huberdo Uyghur group moving forward that would make sense not the rental Patrick Kane you know for the balance of the season and then who cares see you later in UFA thanks for showing up I think you're right the draft picks become the currency there we've heard a lot that the uh, that this year's draft is not one that a lot of people want to move picks for there's a lot of excitement around the first round this year and the flames have both a first and a second i personally think they need to keep that high-end capital especially being a team that's on the bubble um i think it says something there but i mean let's talk about who's off the table at this point is peltier untradeable yeah is coronado Uh, untradeable coronado would be the only uh forward prospect that's really good like connor zari is the other really good one in my mind um he's the only one of those three that i i could see moving and only because of the uncertainty of him being american and playing in the ncaa and not being six feet tall <laughs> see to me though if you start to move let's say coronado if they move coronado for let's just say coronado for Konechny, i think that you're really screwing up the future of this team like there's a team that obviously for whatever reason isn't getting it done and we can debate why that is later I think we need a youth infusion here and giving up your top prospect for a rental, which is all I think you'd get for him at this deadline with where the Flames are, and that's the wrong move. I agree. And, like, realistically, the only uh, rental move that would make sense where Coronado would be included would be if they were to go get Timo Meyer from San Jose, who's, like, a legit star caliber player. And, like, that would be a lot bigger of a deal. And I think if you're going to do that, you've got to have a deal in place with Meyer first. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, that's, like, your eight-year, $9 million type, you know, already pen to paper. Yeah. You know, like the Bo Bo Horvat contract where it is already done. Uh, We're just, uh, you know, pen to paper. In which that case, you know, then losing Coronado is not a big deal because Meyer is basically the upper end of what Coronado could be anyway. So and he's twenty six not... years old. So you're buying what? Let's call it four good years out of him. Well, even you know, like four good years and then two okay years. You know, because say you know, like he's going to be like thirty four by the time thirty three, thirty four 
Like, you know, you're usually still really good until you're 32 before you start stepping down the ladder. So, you know, like, you'd be basically getting, like, the max of what Coronado could be for that duration. In which case, then it's more comfortable shedding that prospect, even though, like, we're not really in a way that we should be. But, you know, that would be basically the only scenario that I could see where it would be palatable to pull that deal. And I think Timo Meyer's going to have such a bidding war, I don't think that Calgary would be the one to put together that package. No, I don't realistically see, like, just from a financial standpoint, how the Flames could pull that one off without handicapping the team in other ways. While but... we agree that they probably need somebody on the back end, I think it's fair to say if they're going to make, let's call it one big deadline move, it's not for defensemen. Um, uh, the only uh, thing that I could see back there is like the, the Chikrin type deal. Well, and if you listen to Kiprios, who I, I think has a fairly good pulse in the league, um, Ki- Chikrin's already going to L.A., yeah, and, like, there are other guys out in around the NHL, like, uh, guys like Travis Sanheim. I guess at that uh, point, though, I don't think I don't think that addressing that at the deadline moves the needle enough. I think that's something you could address in the offseason. Yeah, and that's one of those where, like, the situationalness of it makes, you know, if it makes sense for getting a long-term piece, then you just happen to do it at the deadline. Great, but it's not... And I'll be honest, I don't know the Flames want to add long-term salary right now. I think they're already going to be figuring out how to shed salary next year and not want to take on more. Yeah, I agree on that point. So I think any of those that we look at that, of course, if it makes sense, you you know, you say that all the time, you do it. But looking logically, I can't see them wanting to take on, you know, a a multi-year hockey deal. No, and realistically, like, this team needs to... uh, frankly sort out um like uh, a whole host of things like especially like if say this team stumbles and misses the playoffs well like what where where do you go from here because like you've got Huberdeau well that's it and, and I, I think at that point if they look at themselves as sellers in the off season, you don't want one more asset you'd have to sell well, and, you know, like, you're looking at, like, the last years of Lindholm to Foley and Backlund next year, uh, specifically. Well, that's it. I think and, that's why I don't and, think they want to take on more money right now. I think they're going to have to figure out their own money before they add new money. You know, and it's one of those where, you know, like, with if the Flames struggle and, let's say, like, they miss the playoffs just for, you know, the, the scenario, uh, then do you look at going into a mini teardown rebuild and and in which case you're going to want Coronado and you're going to want your first oh yeah and like that's where like I definitely am more in the stand pat to sell uh side of things this you know until well frankly I don't really see a a scenario where the flames are heavy buyers unless something falls in their lap I just don't think they've got the assets to be buyers nor do I think nor do I think the buying a rental if we take if we both agree that taking on long term money is off the table I don't think a rental solves the flames problems no and like realistically what I would much rather see the flames do is uh, shed some of the guys that are on the flames fourth line uh, some of the veteran guys, uh, I would n- not mind seeing them recouping some picks for guys like Brett Ritchie and Milan Lucic, even if we have to eat salary on both. Well, more so, you know. And like, you're if not going to have to. Eat, I mean, Ritchie's making league minimum. You're not going to uh, eat yeah. salary on that one. If someone can't afford seven hundred fifty thousand, buddy, you shouldn't be shopping. True, uh, but you know what I mean. Like anything to like move. Uh, guys off the fourth line and you know like I would like to see Connor Zari get some games up here Uh, he's been consistently good this year and you know I think that this team has looked best with the players on the fourth line being the young guys and like as good as like Richie and Lewis have played thus far this season um, like when um, um Zahorna, um, Dewar, uh, those guys have been in the lineup. Ruzitska, like even when Ruzitska's not doing very well, he's not, you know, it, he's still okay. But like when you've had those other guys in the lineup, the fourth lines look better. 
and you know i i could see that uh shedding some of the quote unquote physicality for some speed on the fourth line being a way to improve the team as well and giving guys a legit shot for next year as well um to well hey you know if you play well down the stretch you're first in line next year for a job if you you know can play that way and you know it would create some internal competition between everybody which i think would help to drive the forward group a lot more well so if we're in selling mode then let's talk about some of the deals outside of that fourth line that you might look at shedding Okay. Michael, Michael Backlund turns 34 on March 17th. He's a UFA next year and has a cap hit of $5.35 million. He has a 10-team no-trade list in his contract, meaning yes, he would have to submit a, team of, a list of 10 teams he would be willing to be traded to. But I think we could both agree, Backlund's value's never been higher than it is right now. Yeah, realistically, um, you're getting a first-round draft pick for Backlund plus, or you're not trading Backlund. And I think that's fair. Um, you know, he's going to likely win the Selkie Trophy this year, um, in my opinion. Like, even uh, Boston's first line, uh, as good as they've been, you know, uh, Backlund's been absolutely dynamite this year. And, you know, uh, you if you're wanting that kind of guy for your playoff team, you've got to pay for it and you know like it, unless the flames are getting a decent first round draft pick for him there's no it it's too much of a gut punch to the team uh to replace backland because like they don't have anybody that can do what he does no but i think uh, if you bring in that first round pick whether you use it or i mean if we look at what first rounds are worth this you know last couple of years kirby Dock got traded for a first rounder like i think you could use that to bring in a younger more cost-controlled player oh for sure and you know that's where you would need that caliber yeah. of asset but i think moving back on says we're out yeah and you know like at that point like zari would have to be slotted into that third line center spot because like there's literally nobody else and it could be rajishka uh more than likely zari uh just because rajitska has been kind of bad for the last little bit but um you know it, it's tough because of the fact that um like the the flames you know zari is basically the only guy that they have in the organization that could realistically replace what uh backland does and he's well on his way but you know that's a lot to ask of a rookie well i i don't think i think you know you might do that this year but at the same time if they are then out i don't think you have to necessarily replace him with zari i think you could just say you know what we're gonna put Rajishka in there because he's good enough to finish out the year. I mean, you give, you give Zari some looks, but if at that point you're saying, you know, we're we're going to take our chances, well, it doesn't really matter who you replace him with then. True. And, uh, you know, realistically, if the Flames are going to move Backland, I would expect that to be more of a draft or free agency or deadline next year kind of thing. I don't think that with the year left on I, it. I don't I, disagree with you unless, again, they think that the that they're out. And then I think you are you will have a team who would pay a premium for him in the playoffs. True. And it's one of those where basically, like, the eight games that are remaining, like, the Flames would have to lose, like, five or six of them um, to, like, yeah, you're going to miss yeah. uh, before... Yeah, you know, and that opens up like a whole different conversation at that point. Same thing with Toffoli, right? Toffoli's thirty-one on April twenty-fourth. His cap hits four point two five million. He's on pace for his best statistical year. But again, if the Flames move their top line right winger, I'd say arguably the guy who's been the most consistent this year. You're really signaling a rebuild, and I don't see that happening at the deadline. No, I could see that happening next year. Um, and you know if they the flames were to basically recoup the costs that they spent on getting to foley last year sure if they're gonna again go but i think by down, trading but... him then you're you're done for this year you're signaling you're oh done. yeah oh yeah definitely what about Chris Tanev? Chris Tanev, as we know, has been playing through some injuries. He's got a really good contract. He has a 10-team no-trade list. Um, but this is the kind of warrior that if I think I'm going deep, I want him on my blue line. 
Oh, yeah. And again, all three of these guys would return a first-round draft pick. And otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to trade them. And Tanev's a warrior. And, you know, elite defense. Well, we saw last year uh, with uh, Sherratt uh, getting a first from Florida. Like, you know, Tanev's that caliber of guy. And, you know, like it. It might be a late first round draft pick, but a first plus would be. I think Tanev's also the kind of guy you're going to see conditions put on just because of his injuries. I think it could be a first or a second, or, you know, he's got to play so many playoff games. I would be doing that if I was a GM just because we don't know where he's at health wise. Yeah. Like a first, uh, conditional first, or like two seconds. Yeah. I think it'd probably be like a, you know, let's just say a second and a third. And if he plays. 10 playoff games that second turns into a first or something like that yeah or you know he plays more than half of your playoff games yeah you know if you get swept and he plays two of them well hey guess what well that's it yeah i um, think that that makes sense because if he's hurt no one's going to want to give that up and with the uncertainty there i think there'd be a lot of conditions on that yeah and as long as sense. he as long as the games were on friday and he led with his left skate and you know whatever other weird conditions you could think to to put on there yeah you know monahan it there you go. Um, and then the only other name I can think of that might have some value right now. And again, I mean, you don't make these deals unless the Flames are looking at, you know what? Let's run with what we've got. We're okay if we're one and done or we're okay if, you know, we don't make it this year. Um, but we we want to look at selling high. The other guy that I think might return something would be Nikita Zadorov. Oh, for sure. Uh, Zadorov, he'd get a first plus. And I think um, that if we had Oliver Shillington in the lineup, I could actually see that trade potentially happening at the deadline. Yeah. But without that, I mean, I don't think Zadorov is a top four defenseman on a playoff team. That's kind of where he's slotted in here. But if Zadorov's out, who do you play with Uyghur? You got Stone or Gilbert? I know. Well, and realistically, like, you know, as tough as it would be, like, you know, if the Flames are you know realistically looking like they're going to miss uh by the trade deadline um frankly i think it would be better to just look kind of like rip the bandage off entirely and even look at like moving elias lindholm um as much as i personally wouldn't want to see i think that. he's the guy that they want to build around well the thing is that he's like 28 29 as well and you know like that's where you're kind of getting into the, you know, like if you're going to retool, um, you know, if you're going to cash in all your chits, like that's not a bad one to trade I just trade think as you well. could keep him for another year and trade him next year in the in the uh, off season if you need to or even to the deadline. But I think if we're looking at some of these young guys you've mentioned, like Peltier, like Zari, he's the kind of center I would like those guys to have. Oh, I agree. And... It's just tough, uh, like, all of this conversation just because of the fact that, um, you know, like, this team looks like they should be better than what they are. And, you know, um, like, uh, frankly, like, this team, like, if they're going to rebuild, retool, whatever, um, like, it, it's better to kind of rip off the bandage and try to um, weaponize the cap space that would be freed up uh, so that way you could like quickly turn it around and like say uh, just as an example because I brought him up earlier Tyler Bertuzzi goes to free agency you could go and sign him yep. to replace to fully say or you know like whatever whatever yeah. Well, and, and and even looking at other trades that have been made for young guys in the past couple of years, Robert Munich over at uh, Flames Nation brought some of these up. Kevin Fiala for a first and Brock Faber. Oliver Borkstrand for a third and fourth. Booch Navich for a second and Sammy Blaze. Um, you know, Reinhardt for a first and Devin Levi. Doc for a first-round pick. Like, yeah, you can get those free agents, but you could also probably use that draft capital to make those trades in the offseason. True. And, like, I think, like, this team, because the fundamentals are there, uh, it if they are out by the deadline, like, then you're starting to look at, well, like, what do we do with Markstrom? Because, frankly, you know, honestly, at that point, you know, I'm looking at 
LA and saying, well, hey, uh, Cal Peterson's deal's longer, even though Peterson's kind of fallen off the face of the earth, but it, it's cheaper to buy him out. Do you want Markstrom to replace Quick? You know, and <laughs> hope that... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think they move the goalie. You know, it, it's one of those where... That becomes, I think, a longer-term off-season piece. Yeah. You can't dismantle this whole team at the deadline. Like, I don't think all four of those guys that we talked about would get traded. Oh, no. I think any one of them might. Yeah, like, but, the most I, I could see is, like, one or two. If you're dismantling this team, that happens in the off-season. Yeah, like, one or two of those guys get they'll not, you know, all of them. And uh, that would be more like an off-season thing, as you said. And then, as you had mentioned earlier, the other option is to stand pat and let's call it make minor tweaks. We've heard Luke Shen is a name for the Flames back end. You've talked about moving one of those fourth line guys, maybe bringing in a depth defenseman or depth forward. And I think that that's something the Flames wouldn't need to give up a lot of assets for. It could be roster player for roster player, or it could even be moving uh, depth draft capital, which this year they have a fourth, a sixth, a seventh a second and a first. So, you know, you can move that fourth, move that sixth, move that seventh. Um, next year, they've got pretty much every pick except for the fifth and seventh. I think that you could very easily see Tree do that. But even even moving guys in the fourth line or moving those, those um, depth pieces, I don't know how much they move the needle. Like, I think if we want that, we can find those pieces on the Wranglers for the remainder of the year and not have to give up a pick. Yeah, and like realistically, uh, like outside of getting a depth defenseman uh, who's like a defensive defenseman, um, which you know, like Derek Forbort costs a fourth round draft pick, and you know, getting the equivalent of that guy this year probably will be a fourth round draft pick and maybe a, a depth prospect. And at that point, I'd rather take my chances with D. Simone or uh, Mackey. Yeah, or Malosh. It, yeah, and it's one of those where, like, if you feel like this team, like, it, cause, like the Flames, like, say they're still right there in the mix with everybody at the trade deadline, and you're not convinced to buy buy, but you're wanting to improve a little bit. That's when I could see going and getting your Luke Shen type guy just to fill in as the sick number six to improve your number six. And, you know, because that guy is better than D. Simone, Gilbert, Mackey, et cetera, et cetera, and run with that for um, the balance of this season and the playoffs and see, you know, look into re-signing the guy maybe for next season. Um and go from there. If you want to do that, I think if I was Tree, I'd be waiting until almost right at the deadline, which oh, is I agree. What, noon or one, and wait until some other team has made an acquisition and quickly needs to move somebody and is willing to just take a sixth or a seventh because they've just got to quickly move a body or move some salary. Yeah, I agree. And um, that I think that particular trade won't happen until the actual trade deadline day like what That's we saw was... That's the kind was... of trade that gets announced at like 8pm that night because the last one Central Registry cares to get through. Yeah. Well, and that, that's basically like the Forbort and Fantenberg and Eric Gustafson type trades all were the day of um, Schlemko. Uh, you know, like all of those kind of things were all last minute uh, acquisitions. And I think you know, as the Flames... Uh, go for the next couple of weeks uh, will dictate whether that trade kind of a trade is necessary like if they fall on their face the rest of the way to the deadline then like there's literally no need to go get anybody and it's like let's sell off whatever parts you can and you know look ahead to next year so with those three options in mind which one do you I guess which one do you think the flame should do uh, the stand pat and like minor tweaks like realistically i could see the flames shedding one of the or two of the forward depth guys um what the luchichas and the richies uh the roonies that kind of thing um and you know going for you know it, it, miscellaneous insert name of defenseman here uh just to you know like even trading of depth forward for a depth defenseman if you're gonna do it, I think that's the way you have to do it. I don't want to give up this year. I don't want to give up any draft capital. Yeah, 
Well, and that would basically be like, say, like trading Brett Ritchie for a fifth round draft pick and then trading that fifth round draft pick for insert defenseman name here. So you're in effect trading Ritchie for, you know, your defender and getting like the same depth guy there, but, you know, not really spending anything. Yeah. I think the Flames should... I don't think that with what we've seen, we see the consistency to expect this team to go deep in the playoffs this year. I think it's probably if they make it a one-and-done year, first round and out. So I think they should stand pat or be willing to move one or two roster players for draft capital. Because I think this is the year you want draft capital. Yeah. um, I'm finding it hard to... Like especially with the underlying numbers with this team that to like make more substantial like it's not like the Flames have any really top notch free agents at the end of this year like it's basically Lucic and other depth guys where you know like frankly it's not a big deal if they move on after this year so like it's hard to make more of like a hockey deal where like moving say to Foley or Lindholm or Backlund like that's more if of a you're hockey move deal. One of those guys, I think it's either gonna have to be Zadorov or Backlund. Yeah, and realistically, I, I as strange as it sounds, I would much rather keep Zadorov for the long term through a rebuild retool than trading him uh, because I think that he's quietly emerging as a more prolific defenseman. Um, I'm not a huge Zadorov fan, but we don't have something like him in the system. No, and... He, and I think if you look at the two, you'll get a better return for Backlund. Yeah, and, like, realistically, uh, Zadorov, he it has taken, quite frankly, a big step this year uh, compared to his past and is looking more like the guy that the Sabres drafted all those years ago in the first round. And, you know, like, starting to look a little bit like a potential Zdeno Chara light, um, where, like, you know, he might be a 30-point guy who plays, you know, the tough physical game and decent defensively. If he can continue that, you know, you'd want to keep that guy for the next five, six, seven years. So even if uh, the team around him is not very good, you know, like that part is very important. Uh, I still to- think the Flames went out and acquired him maybe in a panic when they knew they were leaving, losing Giordano to Seattle. And I think he's the kind of guy who you'd want to sell to a team in a similar scenario if you're going to sell him. Not now, but at the draft when somebody says, oh, crap, our top four defenseman isn't coming back. Hey, we'll take him and we'll pay you. Because we're worried about paying free agent pricing. Yeah. I don't think that you get the best return for him at the deadline. No. And frankly, I think you're... Like, there's no real incentive on a rush on that. Like, he has another no. full year. And, like, if what happens like if, with the step he's taking this year, if he takes another step next yeah. year, you know, you might be robbing yourself of a legit, like, top three, top four guy just because oh well we're we're wanting to retool and you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot with him and he's I guess when I he's yeah, at that look, right age where like defensemen start to like take off and like Giordano was that age when he really started to become Mark Giordano and um you know what Zadorov is is still not really certain right yet <laughs> and, and at his price we can afford him for another year to find out yeah and you know and if he basically stays flatline for where he is right now and the flames need to sell next year fine you know you're gonna get a first plus for what he brings so i think when i look at this team and when i look at the guy that you'd probably get the most for, I don't think Toffoli goes anywhere. The Flames look at him as a top six forward. I think that's not a deadline deal for the Flames this year because no. they're not that far out. But I think if the Flames thought they could move one roster asset that maybe wouldn't have as much impact, I think it might be Backlund. I think there you could get a lot for Backlund as a deadline acquisition, potentially more than you could as a offseason acquisition. I think you'd get the, the deadline premium. And I think that as you've talked about some of the names at center... I think Trilliving might say, you know what, we can fill that hole for the rest of the year. Yeah. And, you know, like, you look at the past, uh, like, um, going back a, 
quite a ways a name that you know will go down memory lane martin hansel uh was traded from the coyotes to the minnesota wild for a first plus and hansel's not nearly at the time even was as good of a player as what backland is now so even though basically age and stage in their careers they were more or less the same guy and you know it's one of those where you know if the flames could get a first plus for backland and the flames are realistically out of it yeah you look at it um even if they're not out of it i just think that even if they don't think they're going to make a long run i think that's a worthwhile sacrifice yeah uh, yes and no Uh, i think he's too much of a key member of the team where like unless you're uh, literally blowing it right up, then you, you're, uh, yeah. I it, think if you're trying to shed some cap for next year, you're willing to sacrifice. Yes, he's a key member of the team, but I think if you need some cap room and you think you can do some great with that first plus, I think he becomes maybe the sacrificial lamb there. Yeah. But I'm not saying he will go, but when I look at those names we talked about, to me he's the one that I think would be most likely because I think – I don't think you go in shopping him, but I could see somebody making an offer you can't refuse. Yeah. You know, and saying, okay, we can move him and still keep our, you know, our top six intact and may, you know, maybe still have a shot. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see, I guess, what happens over the next couple weeks, but I think any deal the Flames make is not going to come down until deadline day. I don't think we see advanced deals with this team because we they still don't know what they are so for flames fans i think you know if you're hoping for an early deal i think you're gonna have to wait until march 2nd yeah i'm pretty much at that point where you know and it's hard to see uh you know exactly what you know because of the fact that the flames have been so up and down and like markstrom's finally coming up a bit you know like there's just not enough information and you know like the next eight games until the trade deadline will determine everything and you know if the flames show more of what they did against buffalo in the second and third periods moving forward then you know you can buy in and you know possibly make that you know go get that decent you know depth for depth defenseman whatever whatever if they go the opposite way then you know that's a different conversation and it it, we're just not quite there yet unfortunately and it sucks the next three weeks yeah it it just sucks being in the middle (laughs) but that's where we've been all season yep we're used to it by now um just a shout out here the and we've talked a little bit about them already the wranglers still doing great and a big milestone there daniel chechelev gets his first ahl win Daniel Chachalev, for those that don't remember, is a 21-year-old goaltender from Russia. The Flames drafted him in the fourth round, number 96 overall in 2020. Um, He played one game for Stockton last year and 30 games for the Kansas City Mavericks. Now that our affiliation in the ECHL has changed to Rapid City, he's played 33 games with the Rapid City Rush. He has a 16-12-1 record. And he got called up this week. Um, Due to Oscar Dansk, who is the second goaltender in the AHL having a lower body injury. Chechalev got the got called up and started a game for only a second AHL game of his career. Last season, he got one start for the Heat and unfortunately fell in overtime. This past Saturday, not only did he get the start, but he also survived the overtime and stood tall in the shootout to contribute to the Wranglers' win. So I think a good milestone for a guy when you're coming up to that AHL and getting that win. Um, good to see some, some upward mo- motion from Chechalev there. Yeah, and, you know, he's right on track for uh, as you would want a goalie prospect to be, and, you know, he's going through the motions. and he, He's a guy I still think we see in the ECHL for a couple of years, especially with Wolf in the uh, d- in the AHL. I don't think you want to bring him up to split the duties there, but I think developing well from what I've seen and heard. Yeah, and, you know, goalies usually take quite a long while to – get their stuff together as they move forward up the ranks and you know he's right on track for that caliber of goaltender um what his ultimate ceiling is who knows you know uh, we just have to wait and see uh, but you know it's good to see him get his first ahl win 
and hopefully, you know, first of many for him. And, you know, hopefully he keeps developing for the Flames because that would be uh, really good for the team if they ended up having a, a number of guys um, Especially m- moving absolutely forward. Absolutely the goalie bust we've seen in the last little bit. Yeah, well, and, like, that's part of the reason why, like, I've continued to say that, like, you kind of need to add a new goalie every year. Uh, and we were doing that for a while. Mason McDonald and other guys that just didn't turn out. Yeah, and, you know, you, you eventually strike gold with one of them, and, like, every team does, and, you know, the Flames look like they've got one in Wolf, but until he does that at the NHL level, you know, he, it's still ambiguous, and hopefully... You know, with uh, Chechelev and um, uh, Sergachev and uh, the USHL both playing well, hopefully, like well, you, you know, you have guys behind Wolf that are ready to take up the mantle uh, in the seasons to come, and you know, keep that pipeline it moving. It looks like Tyler Parsons did not get signed anywhere this year, so there's another bust. Yep. Um, well, let's talk about what won't hopefully be a bust, and that's this week for the Calgary Flames. We have three games on deck, and we haven't done our predictions in a couple weeks um, be, because of the Flames being off. So let's predict how we think the team's going to do this week. They have the last of their road games on Monday, a 5.30 Calgary start, so make sure you leave work a little bit early for that one, against the Ottawa Senators, a team that has really been the Flames' kryptonite the past couple years. And then almost a repeat of last week, same... It's almost like the game Mastermind. Same color, different spot. Um, same teams, different venue. We see the Detroit Red Wings on Thursday in the Saddle Dome, and on Saturday the New York Rangers come to the Saddle Dome. That's an 8 p.m. start. So, Matt, what do you think for this week? Uh, I'm going to go with what they need, and they need at least two wins, so I'll say two and one. Which two? Uh, the two home games. So you think they, they win against Detroit? And NYR and lose to Ottawa? Actually, I'll switch that up. I'll say that they'll win the Ottawa and the Rangers game and lose the Detroit game. Just Why do you think that? First game back from a long road trip. It's weird how that's really become a thing this year. Yeah. Normally, I don't put much stock into that, but, you know, the Flames basically, any time they've played more than three on the road, they blow the first one. So... For my reason. head and my heart are giving me two separate results this week. My head says they've got that, or I guess my heart, I should say, said they got that great Buffalo win. Um, they're going to come in, they're going to plow through this week, and they're going to get three wins. Yeah, my head really realistically says they're going to be lucky if they get a win this week. So My heart says they lose to Ottawa and Detroit, and they win against the Rangers, and I think that they're going to feel like they have something to prove against the Rangers. Yeah. Uh, they, they very could well lose out this week if they, you know, take it casual. So, And I think this is probably the time where the GM and the coach are talking to these guys as well, saying, look, we've got two full weeks of play here um, until the, the deadline. Like, you guys have to decide what we're doing with you. And I think if if they get zero points this week, I think, again, it's maybe pointing in that sale direction. Oh, yeah. No, if they they need at least four points this week. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They need at least four. What do you do with the goalies this week? Um, as strange as it's going to sound, I would go Markstrom, Markstrom, Markstrom. And, really? Why? Um, he's looking better. And frankly, this team is going to only go as far as Markstrom takes them. And, you know, like if he's going to be ready for the playoffs, he needs to get on a roll. And like if the Flames are going to do anything in the playoffs, it's going to be Markstrom. And, you know, he's looked a lot better over the last couple of weeks. And it, it seems to be getting there with him. Um,. It, you know, especially because of the spacing. Uh, like, there's the day off today before the game tomorrow. Then there's two days off. You know, like, I could see Vladar possibly getting the New York Rangers game. But that would pretty much be the only spot I could see him playing. I think you, you're... It, it would be best to see Markstrom get um, the, the next two. And, you know, as much as, you know criticize Markstrom for his early season performance. He has been better. 
and he needs to if he can get that mojo going and his self confidence back, uh, like the perfect time would be over the next month and a half. Uh, you know, if he can get on a roll where he's actually playing good for what he can do, then like the that's perfect case scenario for the team. And you know, if he can be going gangbusters heading into the postseason, like the Flames could go all the way to the you know because the West is bad. <laughs> you know, for me, I would play Markstrom in the first game of the week against Ottawa, and I think at this point with Markstrom, you play till you lose. Yeah, pretty much. Even if you look good, I think you play till you lose because again, I think they've got to keep. Uh, you got to keep the hot guy in the net right now, and and if you know you're you're losing, I think you got to take him out, and you got to be willing to. I think quicker than Sutter has is make those goalie changes. I agree. So I think you you give Markstrom the net, and you say to Markstrom, "Hey, this is your week. Show us what you can do there." And you know you you've and I think that competition is healthy for goalies, especially. So I think you've got to kind of say, you know what, it's your net. Stay in it. Yep. Yeah. And it's one of those where, like, the team just needs to rally behind their goalie. And, you know, it's time that this team, you know, like, they tend to struggle when Markstrom's in net. And, you know, it took until the Buffalo game. And I think that that might end up being a turning point where, yeah, Markstrom had a really bad first period, but they actually stood up for him after that instead of collapsing. And, they've collapsed previously and you know if they can get the engine turned over where you know they're actually properly supporting the goalie and then the goalie feels confident it, you know because frankly markstrom's problems are all in his ears and he he like that tag thompson goal in the buffalo game like you could see that like he just was at, you know even though it was a perfect shot by thompson just the fact that he gave up another early goal on like the second shot he faced which is kind of the trope of you know like first five minutes oh there goes another one you know he got off of his game and allowed a really weak goal and it's all in the years with him and if he can but we don't have a month and a half to no, get him going that's and what... that's the thing where you know the the season rides or dies with him and the team needs to be better in front of him, and he needs to be better. And I think that them pushing each other and like the confidence from the Buffalo game could be the just the push that he needs to get in that right direction. Because when he's had situations like that, he's responded well, and like he actually played really well the rest of the Buffalo game and made a lot of really good saves in the third period. And where like the game could have went back the other way if he had given up a bad goal in the third. So, you know, if he can start getting that self-confidence back, then, you know, you're going to start seeing the marks from that we're used to, which would be a big, big thing. And I think that... The, well, I guess that's one storyline we can watch for this week. Yeah, it, it's one of those where, like, because the Flames, like, all of their advanced stats are basically showing that they're underperforming, um, and it's... You know, and you see marks from stats, it's kind of easy to see where the problem's been. That, you know, like if Markstrom can correct himself and become like even a league average caliber goaltender again, like the the rest of the team will spurn this team on to many victories. It's just like when you're giving up three, four goals, you know, that are not good <laughs> that, you know, it's hard to collect points from that. So why don't you get us out of here, Matt, and we'll see what he does this week. Yep. So go marks from go and ultimately go flames. Go fireside chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca. 